Welcome back to Face to Facts. I'm Nick Face. We have a great show planned for you this evening as we have the return of Joe and Will to Face to Facts. Welcome back from school. First of all, how did that Thank go? Thank you. Good, good. Great. Coach Joe over here with the UMass Dartmouth. What are they? Corsairs. Course. Where the heck does that come from? French pirate, man. French <laughs> pirate. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. How'd you guys do? We're all right this year. Five and five. Five and five. Better. 500 season, that's not bad. Did you play this year? I did not play this you year. Retired. So I retired. That's right. Up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, welcome back, guys. Uh, we have a lot of good activity going on for both the Patriots, the Red Sox, Celtics, Bruins. Everybody's kind of got a little bit of everything right now to them. So we want to look at the Patriots first. Patriots are coming off their clinching AFC East game against the Denver Broncos. It was a decent game. What do you think? Um, I thought defensively it's a good game. I mean, it's not a great offense, but anytime you hold somebody to three points, that's, you know, it's a good showing on defense. I think yep, we've I improved, so. you know, when Jamie left, we looked a little rough and, you know, a lot okay. of people are saying our defense stunk and I think we've been building and getting better. Will, did you have a different I, uh, outlook of the game? I think the defense, they really stepped up that game. They played better than they have in the last few weeks and, uh, our special teams, uh, we keep kind of all these hiccups. We keep, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, keep winning like that. It's much better with playoffs. Edelman back there. Catching oh, my the God, yeah. yeah. You yeah. actually can watch the game and, and not have a heart attack when Cyrus Jones fumbles the ball every time he's out there. What I liked about the game myself was the defensive side. I thought that that was probably their overall best game of the season on the defensive side. I thought... A lot of standout things happened. You had Logan Ryan with the key interception where Denver was just about ready to score. That was a game-changing play. That's something that needs to happen a little bit more. Was that Ryan's first of the season? I believe it was the first interception. Yeah, I think it was. I thought the line played well for the on the defensive side. What I liked a lot was the overall play that you saw of Butler being – Kind of very involved out there. I thought Ninkovich had a very underrated game myself, too. Any other things that stand out on the, on the defense side? Uh, McCourty's play. Um, McCourty the was the other one I was thinking of. That was because uh, they, they were driving down. He, that hit really. Uh, yeah, that was a big hit. On fourth down yeah. like that, that was a huge play. Did you notice anything else? Um, no, I guess, you know, kind of like what you alluded to is the whole now we got people making the big plays now, which I think is a good thing to be taking into the playoffs is now that we're making the big plays. It looks like they've adjusted. Without, with the losses of, of course, Chandler Jones and Jamie Collins, they had to really roll the dice a little bit and figure out who's going to step into certain roles. It seems like they've defined the roles, are exceeding in the roles that they're in now, and kind of making a really good unit. That's what it looks like in my eyes. However, do we look at this a little differently because this is Denver? Denver's not the same team as they have been in years past. Are we jumping the gun here a little bit? What do you think? Uh, I mean, not jumping the gun. Again, I feel like this stretch we've been playing a little bit better, but, I mean, we did play, you know, pretty terrible Rams offense. We played the Jets in this stretch, and we played Denver. Yep. So they aren't prolific offenses, but I think, you know, we're still making the plays that matter. Didn't most. we go, like, four or five weeks of just opponents that were kind of under 500 a little bit, except the Ravens, basically. Yeah. Outside of the Ravens, I think everybody else has been kind of on the weaker side. I personally think it's great how the season will end with the Dolphins because the Dolphins are a team that's there fighting for the playoff. They want to yeah. win. The game upcoming, being the Jets, that's not so much of a who-cares game, basically. But the Patriots need to be, of course, careful to make sure nobody gets hurt and they can still get the W there. The Dolphins game, I think... Uh... We always seem to struggle in uh, in Miami. We do, and, and it's uh, in Miami, correct? It's in Miami. They're fighting for a spot, so I think that's going to be a harder game than people think. We're going to look at that game in just a moment. I want to still jump back to the offensive side for the on the uh, Broncos game because it was a very uncharacteristic-like game for Tom Brady. Let's not forget that Tom Brady, this is the stadium that he struggles in most. It's at Mile High Sports Authority Field. That's where, for whatever reason, he just has not been able to play his best football there. I was not surprised with how the play calls basically went with running the ball a lot. I wasn't surprised there. But I was most surprised, especially in that first quarter, to see Brady go a quarter without a pass. 
no yeah. completions in the first quarter. Yeah. That was pretty eye-opening to me. Did you see anything different on the offensive side that might need to change or they need to work on better? Um, Will first. I mean, I Brady on that uh, that first uh, that first uh, quarter. He, I think he went 0 for six. I mean, they some of the balls were hitting his receivers' hands, but they weren't Tom Brady throws. They, yeah, they I just weren't that on too. point. And uh, I think I think like you said, that's un, um, unlike him. So I'm not I'm not worried about that. But uh, it can't really he can't be doing that. Mm -hmm. Let's just see. Yeah, I mean, um, same thing, kind of. I mean, again, we're going up against a really good defense in the Denver Broncos, so, mm -hmm. you know, we knew we were gonna, they were going to create some troubles, but, you know, to go on six and not be able to complete a pass in the first quarter, that's stuff where you get in the playoffs and that stuff will bite you. Probably had a lot to do with adjustment, too. I think Brady being out there, I mean, it was freezing cold there. I think it was the highest 16, if that was correct. Yeah, so, yeah. That also has something to do with, making a grip on the ball when you catch it, throwing the ball accurately. I think that ne that needs to be into consideration, too, on why it struggled out of the gate to get going. What I was most surprised with is Denver's defense has usually been known to be extraordinarily well. They have Vaughn Miller. They have Aqib Tlaib. Anybody else that kind of stands out with them? Um, the safety, T.J. Ward. T.J. Really Ward, who yeah. likes to flex his muscles when he's losing. Yeah. Okay, that was very classy on him. Those players really were non-factors for the most part. I think that, number one, Vaughn Miller was just a shell of himself. I mean, I didn't think yeah. that he was very involved with anything I there. Too much. Um, I thought that Tlaib, I mean, Tlaib's a nutcase. He just is. Back when he was with the Patriots, I mean, he was always kind of the psycho in a way. Well, he still is. After the game, apparently the, uh, the Broncos were fighting with each other yeah. about how they were able to hold the Patriots to 16 points and not get the win. That's a team that I just don't see being in the playoff. I thought that was kind of disgraceful in a way for a team to kind of fight and everything after a game. Yeah, you didn't score, but it doesn't revolve around fighting with each other about, about anything there. So I was, I was surprised on how things went down there a little bit, but I guess that's what Denver's like now. Yeah. Any other things on the Broncos side? On the Patriots side. All right, let's look at the Dolphins game that's upcoming. We have the Jets that are coming up Christmas Eve, which is pretty cool. You can start your parties and festivities a little early on those days, which is nice. But then the Dolphins on New Year's Day will be the big game. That's the one that the Patriots definitely want to be able to come back and get a nice win with. Kind of from last year, they didn't really play their A game. They didn't have a lot of the, the starters that were out there. What needs to happen when the Patriots play the Dolphins? What needs to happen? Um, well, I think we're seeing another kind of a weak offense now that uh, Ryan Tannehill won't be playing. They have Matt Moore, who is uh, – he's been in the league for many years, but he yeah. just doesn't have the game experience that uh, a quarterback needs to beat the New England Patriots. Okay. So uh, I think as long as their defense keeps it up, like even though playing. he put up four touchdowns, he did. Last week. He did put up four touch. Uh, who they play last week though? So the Jets. The Jets. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. What do you think? It's choppy. Um, the coach I feel is like this time last year when we were having this conversation. I think it was around the same time, and we played Miami, and we kind of just ran the ball the whole game. I kind of expect the exact same approach where if we have the number one seed, and you know the bye and home field throughout already locked up after this mm -hmm. week based on what happens. Obviously, I feel like we'll see a that lot of that of just point. being preservative and just being, you know, play it safe. Um, around the rest of the NFL, we have, of course, the Patriots wrapping up their AFC East. It is important to know some of the teams that are upcoming. That way, fans know what's going on with the rest of the league. So any particular team that's playoff in the playoff hunt that deserves some – at least talk about right now. Um, Who are you going to think about? I mean, I'm looking at the Chiefs personally. I think that's one team that you have to look out for, and it's a team that the Patriots could very well play. Yeah, that's true. I think the Chiefs, I like the Chiefs' chances. I like the Patriots' chances when they're at home. If the Patriots have to travel to Arrowhead and have to play the Chiefs, that's risky. I mean, it was two years ago. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was one of the worst losses of not just the season, but in Patriots history. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that was a terrible loss. It was a changing 
of the guard loss in a way because the Patriots started going. But I think it's a team they want to avoid. Um, guess if I were to pick a team, um, I would what? pick Oakland just because lately they've been just finding ways to win. So I feel like that's one of those teams where if we play them, and they can hang around for 60 minutes. Yep. You know, they can find a way to win. That's the only thing that really scares me about them. And other than that, there's nobody that really worries me at all. I'm not worried about Pittsburgh. Not worried about Baltimore. We've seen what we can do when we play Baltimore. So I just feel like a team like that, that if you let them hang around and they can find a way to win, that's what worries me. But I See, don't I, think that. I kind of disagree. I think the playoffs is a whole different atmosphere. And mm -hmm. teams like the Chiefs and teams like the Raiders, who haven't been there in many years, they don't really have that, that experience like uh, New England does. But mm -hmm. then teams like Pittsburgh and teams like Baltimore, they come to play, come uh, come the, uh, the playoffs. And I, I just – those games are always I tough. I think so. that it's important that we mention all of those teams that are kind of in the hunt. The other team is also, of course, the Dolphins. But all those teams right there, let's look at the Ravens. I mean, the Ravens have come into Gillette many times, and they have stripped that playoff hopes and dreams out of everybody's hands. So that's a team I certainly don't want to be matched up for in the, in the playoffs. Pittsburgh doesn't scare me. It doesn't. Yes, they have their parts. They have Roethlisberger. They got Bell, and they got Antonio Brown. The Patriots have always just seemed to have the upper hand against yeah. Pittsburgh. Brady always plays. Brady plays out of his against, mind yeah. out against Pittsburgh. So maybe that's because of a rivalry between Big Ben and him. I don't know. Chiefs is just the one that I'm looking at saying I really don't want. I'm not really scared of Oakland. I'm not. I think I Oakland coming here specifically, if the Patriots went out and get home field advantage, I just think the, they almost in a way peaked too early. Moving over to the NFC, I think there's some better teams over, obviously over there. Absolutely. I think you have to look first at Dallas. Dallas has been a really a spectacular story with Dak Prescott, their quarterback. They got Ezekiel Elliott as their running back. Those two kind of have made almost like the dynamic duo of turning that organization and franchise around a little bit. What do you think about Dallas? I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see how they're going to play in the playoffs. Um, I know Dak hasn't been what he, what he was in the beginning of the season. He's been a little slow the past uh, few games. Um, but I'm curious how they're going to play. I don't I – don't, I don't, Is he I overrated? Don't I think a little bit. I think, I think they're the two of them, they're both great players. But mm -hmm. I think the hype is just – Two rookies are running the league that, like, uh, I think they're a little overrated. What do you think? Um, overrated, maybe a little bit. Uh, I feel like, you know, he's kind of got the same thing going for him that Romo has where, you know, you can kind of hide some of the flaws mm -hmm. with the run game because it's so good. Um, and with an offensive line like that, they can really protect and give him the ability to make better throws. Uh, again, it's a story of the line. I think that's mm -hmm. what's also made – <clears throat> Let's go back two years ago when DeMarco Murray was a rookie oh, yeah. with the Cowboys and he was just running for a field day, basically. Basically the same system that's mm -hmm. in play right yeah. now, and it's why Elliott has been going ground and pound into the end zone for the most part. I think we're seeing that Elliott is very talented, but if he was probably put on another team, I don't think he puts up the same numbers. I don't I think don't. so either. I don't think he does. Um, other teams that we want to make sure we, we, are, we know a little bit about, too, is, of course, the Giants. We know the history of Patriots-Giants. For me, personally, that's one team that I have want no business near. I mean, this is just like 2010. Giants, uh, in the beginning of the year, they weren't anything special. They got hot at the right time, and uh, they came in and ended up winning the Super Bowl, but... Now, the Giants, I heard, were got, got penalized because they were using walkie-talkies on the sideline. Did you hear about yeah. that? So, is there anything that happens during the season for a penalty here with them? They just got fined. Just a um, fine. The franchise, 150000 okay. The coach, 50000 And their fourth-round draft pick got pushed to the back of the fourth round. That was just about it. So, they kind of threw it under the rug a little bit. Of little course, bit. not like the Patriots. Yeah. That's how it goes. Well, they hate us because they ain't us. Now, other teams in the hunt. You have the Packers. You have the Lions. The Falcons. Of course, you have to mention the Seahawks. And then Tampa, maybe on the outside looking in. Any of those teams deserve a mention here? Seahawks, I think, yeah. are a threat. Yeah. I think the Seahawks are a good team. I think it could very well be a rematch of 2014. Yeah. Could be with the Seahawks there. Do you have a different um, case scenario? I mean, 
obviously you got to respect the Seahawks. I think them losing Earl Thomas is pretty huge. Now yeah. They just don't have that guy roaming back there that can make these plays on this field like he does. Um, obviously, they're still a threat. Um, and then I think, you know, we've already alluded to it, the Giants are my big worry. I just don't want to play those guys just because every time we play them. So who's the ideal matchup? Who is it? The Bucks? No. <laughs> who is it most likely going to be for the Super Bowl this year? Who is who are who are the two most likely teams? Dallas or Seattle versus the Pats. Okay, I can I see agree. that. I agree, and I I still think the Giants have a very fair shot. Mm -hmm. And also, I I don't think you can sleep on the Packers. Um, I think they've won what four, four five straight four. Yeah, yeah. And, they're clicking uh, right now. Yeah, they got hot at the right point. Yep, and uh, I think Aaron Rodgers is playing real well. Their defense stepped up a ton, and uh, we'll see uh, what they have to come uh, for the playoffs. Now you just mentioned the phrase kind of sweep it under the rug, correct? Yeah. Well, one of the things that the Red Sox did yesterday was pretty much got the broom and swept somebody out of town. That person is the one of the longest tenured Boston Red Sox. Clay Buckholtz <clears throat> has been traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. He is no longer a Boston <clears throat> Red Sox. Thoughts on Mr. Buckholtz? How will we remember Mr. Clay? <laughs> um, I'm not going to miss him. No. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, you know, obviously we didn't get a ton for him, but I think what we got was of value. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we did a good job of getting rid of him and getting at least a little something in return. So mm -hmm. I'm happy. you got your Red Sox hat on. You I must, do. You must I be do. wearing that in pride today. I am. I mean, <laughs> I think uh, I, I, I almost feel bad for the guy because I think he had a better career than people give him credit for because he did, he did have his, uh, his bad seasons. But uh, I'll always rem uh, remember when we uh, his first year, his second game in, he comes in with a no-hitter, and that kind of sticks out to me. And then uh, – 2013, he had a great year, the year we won. Yeah. And uh, I, we got to give a lot of credit to him for, uh, I think he helped us with that ring. Oh, boy. How will I remember Clay Buckholtz? A guy with unlimited amount of potential just being nothing but a disappointment. I'm sorry. I mean, maybe it was because he came up. It's actually his first game that he ever was in. Pitched a no-hitter. Yeah. That was his first game that he came up as a major leaguer through a no-hitter. So already, the expectation was already extraordinarily high. I think that right there was the worst thing that ever happened to him. Because I yeah. think it ruined, not ruined, but I think it kind of put him on a pedestal a little bit. And that pedestal meaning everyone's going to think he's going to be the next day's pitcher. That just didn't happen. Did he have the talent? Sure did. When he wanted to pitch. What I couldn't stand is the amount of excuses that that guy gave over the past two years Oh, uh, I just didn't feel it today. Oh, uh, I have too much bullfrog on. I have too much. Oh, my hair's in my eyes. Oh, my hangnail hurts. I, I couldn't deal with it anymore. I couldn't deal with it. So that right there, the move that Dombrowski made, I thought it was a great move. They got rid of, most importantly, that contract for $13.5 million. The Phillies are going to pay the entire dime on it. So that gives the Red Sox some salary relief. Here's my next question. Where do the Red Sox go from here? Is this a move that sets up another thing to happen? What do you think? I think we go to the World Series from here. Ooh. That's a I like this team at. right now. I like oh, what yeah. I have. Absolutely. What, you got Price. You have Sale. You have Porcillo as your threes. One, two, and three. Then you also have Stephen Wrights, who's in the fold. You have Eduardo Rodriguez is in the fold. Drew Pomerantz in the fold. Heck, there could be somebody from Pawtucket that surprises you in spring training. That could be Henry Owens, who's still property of the Red Sox. That's also Brian Johnson, who was out last year. He had um, some kind of physical issues, mental issues that were going on. And then you also have Rowena Elias, who could also come and surprise you too. So the depth is still there, even though you parted with one of your pitchers. I think this is a series for another move. You already have a team that's put together that looks on paper to be World Series caliber. The Red Sox can say all they want about trying to stay under the salary cap and not have to have pay a penalty. Let's remember this. This is a team that has the second highest payroll in baseball. They could give a crap about staying under a salary cap threshold. So my question here, what is the next domino? What is it? 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think every – I can't really think of a position that we don't have, like – First base has Moreland at that's, it. That's true. But you could upgrade that because there's still a couple bats alive there in the market. Yeah. The question will be, do the Red Sox want to spend the money? I, I was thinking that if we did get a first baseman, we put Hanley at DH. That yeah. could be a move. Edwin Encarnacion is still out there. Nobody wants him for whatever reason it is. Seems like he's a great guy, great teammate. There's a problem with teams that have offered something called the qualifying offer. It's a 17.5 one-year deal. If there's no deal to be made, then they, the team that originally had them, being the Blue Jays, could basically take them because they have made, basically they, they are paying to make sure they get a prospect in return. A little confusing for some of the fans out there that are saying, what the heck is a qualifying offer? Why aren't these players signed? Well, players attacked are attached with a draft pick. That means if a team like the Blue Jays qualified Jose Batista and Edwin Encarnacion, they're getting a player back in return if they sign elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's why those players are still unsigned. I would give it a shot if I were the Red Sox. Putting Encarnacion right there, there's your David Ortiz replacement. And that's what David Ortiz kind of wanted in the first place. He'd want him here. So do you like the rest of the team and the makeup? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Bullpen starting, hitting, yes. all that. Um, wrapping up our show very quickly, we want to go over a Christmas wish list. Each oh team, I want you to think about each team for a second. That's Red Sox, Patriots, Bruins, Celtics. I want you to think of a gift that you particularly would like to give the Celtics or the Red Sox, the Bruins, or the Patriots for Christmas to make their team better. What do you think? Joe, we'll start with you. Um, we'll start with the Patriots <clears throat> first. Patriots is easy. Uh, Super Bowl. Super Bowl. One That's for the it. thumb. One yeah, for the we thumb. Just need the fifth. Yeah. You need the fifth to make a whole handful. Plus, you want to make sure maybe the third finger is right up at Roger Goodell when Brady <laughs> takes the trophy from him. Yes. So that exactly. would be good. Maybe the newest of the rings would be good to put that one there. Definitely. Um, I agree on the same front. Uh, let's go to the Red Sox quickly. Um, Red Sox, uh, World Series. <laughs> Boy, we <laughs> Championship. Do you have a different one? Um, I'll say I'll say we need that first baseman or we need that DH. We okay. need a better than Mitch Moreland. Yes. Okay, I yeah. would say the same. I go with uh, another year of David Ortiz. You know uh, how much I just true. won't let it go. He's just done. Won't, I'm, I'm won't let it go. I'm that's not. A, that was another a, year of David Ortiz. Give him some new ankles. Give him some new toes. Oh, I don't care. New feet. Put them on. <laughs> strap them on. Let's go. Going to the Celtic side of things, we already pretty much know what you'd like. Yeah, yeah DeMarcus Cousins. Okay. I want him. I'll agree with Will DeMarcus Cousins. I, I, I would like myself some sort of a star power to get this team past the first round. They need to get into the second, third, and maybe even get to the finals. Hey, if you get a chance to, knock out Golden State, whoever else is going to be out there too. It will be exactly. nice to see the Celtics get a nice championship. Notice how we never mention the Bruins on this show. That's because they're a disgrace right now. They don't deserve to be talked about. So, what would you give the Bruins right now? Um, a new coach. A new coach. Need a new coach. Is it the coach, though? Yes. I think that lately... Now, you now know, maybe the last we should have talked years, about the Bruins because it could be a little you know, bit I mean, obviously, you can chalk it up to them not playing as well, too. But I think that one of the issues that's been, you know, prominent for the last two years is Claude Julian. I think, you know, your time has come. Okay. I want the old uh, Patrice Bergeron back. He's been playing real uh, slow this year, I think. And uh, oh, you're older on. Let's. I know. And uh, eventually, we're gonna need to. We're gonna need to do something. I don't know. This team's not gonna win. Anyway. I personally would fire the entire front office. That's Cam Neely. That's the Jacobs brothers. All of them up there. Goodbye. You have ruined this team. Peter Shirelli, all those mistakes that he made with signing guys like Krejci and Lucic and all these guys long-term, it has completely screwed this team. They have no money, no flexibility, no roster management whatsoever. They, they run the Providence shuttle up and down every, every single game that's going on. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. I get frustrated watching it because you got Tuka Rask who's having an outstanding season here. You get Pasternick scoring about 20 goals. He'll be yeah. traded next year. Don't yeah. worry. Don't worry. We don't, we don't believe in 40-game in, in goal, goal scorers in Boston. So 
Sorry we're so negative on my side about the Bruins, but it's about time you put your big boy pants on and actually learn how to play in the NHL. That's my rant of the day. There you go. How about that? Anything else to add? Oh, by the way, happy holidays. <laughs> Anything else you want to add on face the Pats? I think we hit it all. Go Pats. Go Pats. Sorry, I'm not Scrooge over Christmas. It's just I, I, I got this thing with Bruins right now that's just they, they rip your black and gold out in your heart. So <laughs> I'm just sick and tired of it. So this is our last show before uh, the holidays and all. We hope you all have a great and safe holiday. We will see you uh, probably one more episode before the new year. So happy holidays to you all. Joe and Will, thank you for joining us on Face to Facts. We will see you soon. Goodbye.